Welcome everyone to the 2016 Winter Webinar Series. This year we're going to be focused on food security in Iowa and we're really glad to have you here today to discuss hunger in Iowa. I've got with me today Christine Raddick who Hello. is from the family side of Extension and I'm Susan DeBleek and I work as the program assistant for the Iowa Master Gardener program. We've got three parts to the, seri to the webinar series this year. Today we're going to be focusing on hunger in Iowa and exploring what that looks like and how, as Master Gardeners, we can best work with people who are experiencing hunger. Next time we're going to be talking about working with food banks, which many of you Master Gardeners have experience with in terms of donating. Uh, we're going to be exploring best practices for food safety after that, so for those of us who are growing food in the garden to donate, that we're making sure that we're meeting all of the food safety practices that we should be. And for today, we've got a couple materials for our attendees, and I just want to note that these webinars are focused on Master Gardeners, and we welcome any additional participants that want to come. A few materials that we have, we've got a handout for you, and this is where you can take some notes and also where you can write down some ideas when you're doing a couple discussions today. We also have an evaluation. Please fill out the evaluation and hand it back to your coordinator today. We'd love to get feedback on how this webinar went. And also, I want to let you know that you have access to the grant guidelines. We're going to be talking about mini grants today. and Hopefully you've got a copy of the mini grant guidelines so you can look into whether or not you want to apply for the mini grant. We're going to be talking about SNAP Ed, which is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Education. We're going to be talking about food insecurity in Iowa. And then we're going to tie it all together within Master Gardener projects and then talk about some strategies that Master Gardeners can start to use to approach food insecurity. All right, I'll hand it off to Christine. Okay, hello everybody. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, I have had a tremendous learning curve in the last year or so, getting to know some of the priorities of Master Gardeners and how we can um, cooperate together. A little bit about me, I come from Human Sciences Extension and Outreach, and my role is coordinating nutrition education programs for families experiencing poverty. So if you happen to have one of our direct education programs in your community. You might know it as Buy, Eat, Live Healthy. We do direct education with um, families with low income, um, focusing primarily on families with children. And I work on campus in Ames as the coordinator for the program, and it's administered by um, specialists and program assistants across the state. So many of you will have these folks um, in your communities and may have crossed paths with them at the Extension Office before. Um, so glad to be here. I'm going to give you a little bit of a window today into some of the work that we do in Extension related to families experiencing um, poverty and hunger. And it's so exciting to be able to talk about how Master Gardeners can be an important um, player in helping families um, experiencing those problems. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you today. Okay, so a little bit about the introduction for this project. Um, together, we are hoping that we can make fresh fruits and vegetables more accessible for families experiencing poverty in Iowa. We have a fabulous network of food banks in Iowa, and you're going to hear more about them on the next webcast. But one of the challenges that food banks um, deal with is procuring enough fresh fruits and vegetables for all of the families that they serve. Um, the perishability of fruits and vegetables, the expense of fruits and vegetables, um, all make it challenging to distribute them through the food bank and food pantry system. It takes really creative partnerships to do that. And I think that the Master Gardeners can be a major player um, in this type of work. So what we're going to be talking about today is a collaborative effort between the ISU Master Gardener Program and ISU SNAP Education. So SNAP Education may be a new term for you. As Susan said, it stands for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program 
education. So SNAP is the new name for food stamps. Um, it's the emergency um, food assistance benefits available to families across the country um, with low income. And SNAP has a piece of its budget each year that is set aside for nutrition education, for families who qualify, and not just education, but also programs that make healthy choices easier. So not just providing nutrition guidance and recommendations, but also policy and systems projects that make those healthy cho choices easier to do. Um, so the project we're gonna be talking about today is one of those, um, those efforts to make healthy choices easier. So a little bit about SNAP. Um, it stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, previously known as Food Stamps. We make it super duper complicated in Iowa and we call it Food Assistance. Um, so the image here shows you um, down in the lower right what the Food Assistance card looks like. Um, sometimes participants will call it EBT um, because it uses an EBT card. Um, this is an example of a farmer's market that accepts the Food Assistance card. Um, SNAP education is also funded by USDA, just as the SNAP program is. Um, it actually comes out of the same budget. Um, SNAP education is present all around the country, and it looks a little bit different in every state. Um, some states focus mostly on children, some more on adults. Um, here in Iowa, we do a mix of children, adults, and older adults, given um, the demographics of our state. We have, we have a lot of older um, Iowans here. Okay, so a little bit about what SNAP education looks like here in Iowa. Um, we know that Iowans who experience poverty are at a higher risk for chronic diseases and obesity. Um, it's kind of strange when you think about hunger that you'd think hunger is the opposite of obesity, but in the United States, um, hunger doesn't always look like you would expect it to look. Um, they're strange bedfellows. You often see obesity and hunger together. And that comes from the fact that people often have access to enough calories, um, but they're not calories in the forms of food that their body needs to be healthy. Um, they're calories that come from um, sources that are not very nutritious. Um, lots of sugary carbohydrates and higher fat foods. So you can see someone who is hungry, who is food insecure, who is actually overweight because the food available to them is not food that promotes um, health. And in fact can be food that um, either causes or makes worse a chronic disease. Um, so our job is to educate families in poverty about healthy behaviors and healthy choices, um, help them feel like they can um, exercise those healthy behaviors, um, but also make those behaviors easier to do. One of the things that's, things that's really important for us is the guidance that we give um, through ISU Extension and Outreach about um, healthy eating, meal planning, smart shopping, we wanna make sure that those recommendations are possible for the families that we're working with. So the kind of second part of our job is working on making those choices easier through different policies and systems projects. Okay, so a little bit more about SNAP education at ISU. Um, we provide direct education programs. We focus a lot on skill building. Um, you know, most people know that, that eating healthy is important and they often know what types of foods are healthy choices, but there are a lot of things that get in the way of actually doing those things. Um, and some of them are skills, skills in things like cooking, um, grocery budget management, smart shopping, um, and then actually putting those healthy nutrition practices um, into effect. So we do a lot of skill building around cooking, whether someone is a completely new cook or has been at it for a while and is just looking to um, learn some more healthy strategies for cooking. Also meal planning, grocery list making, um, to really manage that grocery budget effectively. We consider ourselves successful if a family we're working with, no matter how limited their means, feels like it's possible for them to make healthy meals on their budget. Even if that means they need to visit the food pantry, they need to participate in SNAP, plus the f funding that they have from their income, 
that it is possible for them to do. Um, and then also engaging in projects that make healthy choices easier. This is one of them that we're going to visit about today. Um, so, a collaboration with Master Gardeners. Um, this project really began behind the scenes about a year ago um, in conversations about different organizations and programs um, through ISU Extension that could get involved with SNAP-Ed um, to uh, make some of these healthy choices easier. We know that a lot of Master Gardeners are already engaged in this type of work. And we wanted to really harness that and tell those stories and make the most of that existing experience and capacity. There are a lot of you out there and you have a you know, tremendous ability um, to make a difference um, in this particular issue. Um, so our goal with this project is to make fruits and vegetables more accessible to families in poverty by working through the existing system of food banks and pantries. Uh, these are the components um, that we're going to visit about today and in the future um, webcasts. There will be two more in addition to today's. Um, so starting with the webcasts, doing some basic um, kind of education about the realities of hunger in Iowa, working within the food banking system, and then also a little bit about food safety when it comes to growing for food banks. Um, demonstration gardens. There are going to be seven model donation gardens on ISU research farms uh, planted this growing season to really illustrate some of the ideas from these trainings um, as to what a donation garden looks like and how it might be a little different than just a community vegetable garden. Some of the important features of a donation garden specifically. And then we're really excited to put some mini grants out for master gardeners to actually take on some projects related to food security in their communities. So we're going to talk a little bit about those today as well. Um, so kind of keep your eyes peeled for announcements coming out about these things. Um, for example, the model donation gardens that are going to be on the research farm, there will be field days um, to visit those gardens and we'd be anxious to have a lot of master gardeners attend those. Here's a map showing where those model donation gardens are going to be. Um, so you can see they're kind of spread throughout the state with two kind of clustered together down in southeast Iowa. Um, each of these research farms will have the um, model home garden planted as a donation um, garden this year. So some of the foods that are going to be planted in those model donation gardens. Um, this graphic shows you what they are. You're going to hear a little bit more about this at the next webcast, but these foods have been chosen um, very specifically actually through about three or four months of discussion with the Iowa Food Bank Association to determine what are the foods that are that perfect combination of being relatively easy to grow in Iowa, um, able to weather a couple of days in the food pantry system and not get bruised and battered and um, wilted such that people wouldn't want them. And third, are uh, recognizable to a lot of our food pantry clients, are things that they are excited to take, know how to use. Um, some of them can be eaten out of hand, don't require any special preparation. Um, so these are the items that are going to be planted in the model donation gardens. Um, and we'll visit again on the next webcast about how you can make those decisions should you choose to set up a donation garden. Um, so a little bit how you can get involved with those demonstration gardens. Um, they're going to be looking for help with planting, weeding, harvesting, delivery. Um, contact your local extension staff um, if you're interested. Uh, we particularly are going to need um, a couple of master gardeners at each site who are committed to assisting with the actual harvesting and delivering um, of the product to the donation site, to the food pantries that are going to receive that food. Um, because we'll be evaluating the success of this project on the research farms by weighing all of that produce so that we can really communicate our impact. And so having a couple of people who are willing to step up and take responsibility for doing that would be really helpful. Okay, so a little bit about the mini-grants. Um, they're going to be up to $1,000 each. 
Um, that doesn't mean every proposal would have to be up, would have to include $1,000 worth of budget, but that would be the maximum. Um, in order to apply for the mini grants, we ask that at least one person from the team applying engage in the webcasts. Um, you should watch your Master Gardener newsletters for details about them and secure county staff support that whoever your county Master Gardener um, staff person is um, should make sure that they understand what you're proposing and that they're in support because the the funds route through the ISU fiscal process in the county. So you'd want to make sure that they um, kind of knew what was up and were on board. Uh, the application is quite simple. It's done online and it's due March 1st of 2016. Um, so we hope that you will, throughout this webcast and the next two, um, really give some thought to a project that you might like to take on um, related to food security um, in your community. So we have a few categories of projects that are eligible for the funds from the mini grants. We're going to walk through those a little bit today. So the first is GROW. Um, under GROW, we consider that to be um, either converting, maintaining, or starting a donation garden. Um, so that's any vegetable garden for the purpose of donation. Um, the costs for plants, for soil, for small tools up to $100 in value, all of those would be eligible costs um, under the mini grant. And in a garden of this type, $1,000 could go a really long way to getting a garden established. And of course, this first year is an important startup year if you're actually starting the garden from scratch. Um, and we're hoping that we will have funds available in the future. Um, but, you know, think about converting as well. If you have existing gardens, that a portion of them might be able to be converted for um, donation gardening. The second category of project that we think we will see in these mini grants is what we're calling Connect. So this is bringing growers and food pantries together. Um, a grower can be a backyard gardener. It can be, um, you know, a gardening group, a community garden. It can even be a small farmer. Um, but bringing growers and food pantries together locally to determine methods of cooperation, to talk about priorities, to really hear from your local food pantries how folks who grow food can be helpful to them is really valuable. Um, so we know master gardeners are very well connected in their communities um, and know a lot of the folks who are gonna be growing food in the area. So one of the things that you could do is hold an event to bring these people together um, and really come up with a plan for how you're going to cooperate in the future. Um, you could also start a food rescue among local growers. If you've got some growers in the area who are doing food gardening, who would be willing to give a portion of their crop if somebody was willing to come and pick it up and transport it, um, or come to the farmer's market and rescue what remains unsold at the end of the market, those types of projects would be eligible as well. We would still consider that to be under the Connect heading um, because ultimately it's bringing the grower and the agency that needs the food together in some fashion. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing kind of the creative ideas that you all have under this Connect um, piece. And then the third option is the teach piece. We're going to talk a little bit more um, in detail today about the teach piece. Um, on the future webcasts, we'll get into the connect and grow pieces a little bit more deeply, but today our focus is teach. Um, under the teach umbrella, we would expect to see things related to food gardening education for individuals who seek service from food banks or food pantries. So an example might be um, if you, for example, wanted to use your funds to purchase plant starts to distribute through a food pantry and provide education and tools at that site for folks who wanted to grow their own food, um, that would be a great cooperation. Um, so this is the education piece, which we know many of you have a lot of experience with um, getting in touch with a food bank or food pantry partner and um, visiting with them about how you might be able to distribute um, 
some materials and provide education for the families that they serve. Okay, so a little bit into the weeds about the mini grants. Um, you can find all of this information available in the written guidance as well. Um, but these are some of the allowable expenses that we think are probably the primary ones that we'll see. So seeds and seedlings, potting soil, compost, fertilizer. Um, we say small tools. Uh, the definition for us of small tools is no single item more than $100. Um, so we're not talking, you know, huge power tools, but small gardening tools. Um, also mileage um, for travel that's incurred as part of the project. And then promotional peer materials if you run into costs related to printing and that sort of thing would all be fine okay so the next portion of the webcast is going to be a little bit of background for you on food insecurity in Iowa I'm going to share with you some data and statistics about the reality of food insecurity in Iowa um, really how our state looks in terms of um, food insecurity for many of us I know myself growing up as a child in Iowa City I would not have thought that there were people in my community who ever went hungry at night um, so this is going to be just kind of a little um, window into what the reality of food security looks like in Iowa. So definitions. Um, for those of you who, who don't have experience in this field, when we use the term food insecurity, we mean it's a state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. And note that I underlined nutritious. Um, in America, we often have access to enough calories. Um, but we don't have access to enough affordable, nutritious food. So someone, as I mentioned before, can be both food insecure and overweight. It's actually quite common in Iowa um, to be in that position. Um, another piece that I like to add to this definition is the food needs to be able to be procured in socially acceptable ways. So when we say someone is food secure, it means they have enough um, affordable, nutritious food that they're able to procure in socially acceptable ways. So that's through um, you know, their own groceries, through restaurants, through food pantries, through meal service programs, things that are socially acceptable. We do not consider getting food from dumpsters, that sort of thing, to be part of socially acceptable food access. Um, so I think the socially acceptable is an important piece here. Okay, so some data about food insecurity in Iowa to give you a sense for kind of the scale of the problem um, in our state. One in eight Iowans is food insecure. Um, that's 389,250 people. And within that number, about 140,000 of them are children. Um, so children are carrying a disproportionate amount of this um, of this problem in Iowa. And in some counties, um, for example, in Polk County, um, one out of every five children um, is food insecure. Um, so in some counties, it's even more pronounced. The highest overall rates of food insecurity in our state are in the counties listed here. Um, so if you see yours on the list, um, you know that you've probably got um, some significant partners in your area that you could be working with um, to help with this problem. Um, so Webster, Blackhawk, Story, Decatur, Appanoose, Davis, Des Moines County, and Lee County are some of our highest rates. You'll notice that there's a stretch of those there, um, the last few on the list, that run right along those bottom two tiers of the state. Um, we tend to, in general, see higher rates of rural poverty in those areas. Okay, so a little bit about the effects of hunger. We know that hunger in America looks different than the hunger that you might see you know, on an infomercial for a, a agency wanting you to donate money for starving children around the world. Um, it really looks different in America. Um, but a lot of the effects are the same. So we're going to talk a little bit about the effects of hunger um, that folks in Iowa and folks in the rest of the United States experience. 
So we know that children carry a disproportionate burden of hunger and food insecurity. So education is an important area to look at when we're talking about the effects of hunger. Um, we know that food insecurity impairs academic development. Um, food insecure children, twice as likely um, as their well-nourished peers, peers to be referred for special education services. Um, this is particularly true early in life. So in kindergarten, first, second grade, um, when children have not yet developed coping mechanisms to deal with the fact that they're hungry, um, they, they tend to act out more in school and schools try to adjust by referring them for special education. Um, adult health, obviously critical as well. Um, food insecure adults are more likely to develop chronic diseases. Some of the big ones I've listed here, um, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, these are more likely to develop if you're food insecure. Chances are if you're food insecure, you're eating what food is available to you um, on, a, on a really easy access kind of basis. And often that's going to be higher calorie, higher fat, higher sodium foods um, that don't allow you to manage a chronic disease like diabetes very well. Um, mental health, as you can imagine, is also really affected. Um, food insecure adults may experience higher levels of aggression and anxiety. Um, some of this is biological. Um, one of the studies that I didn't include here um, but we often see these uh, problems more exaggerated among women. Um, a lot of our low-income families in Iowa are female-headed households um, where there's only a single parent present and that parent is a woman. And we hear all too often stories that women will not eat so that their children can. Um, so you can see some of these mental health um, issues more, more um, present in women um, than in men, um, according to some studies, and we suspect that that might be why it is, um, because women tend to be making more of those compromises because they're more likely to be raising children um, while going through um, these problems with food security. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, food insecurity and obesity really intimately related. Um, access to calories may be plentiful, but healthy food less so. Um, much more difficult to access, much more difficult to store, um, prepare. Um, all of those barriers are, are very real for families with low income. Um, a little bit about maternal health. Um, inadequate access to food during pregnancy increases a lot of risks, both for mom and for baby. Um, the number one risk being low birth weight babies. Um, a baby born with low birth weight, um, there's a lot of, of future problems associated with it. Um, everything from a lower IQ to a higher risk of overweight and obesity. Um, and some of these problems hold true even if the child doesn't experience food insecurity in its early life, even if they have a healthy diet moving forward. If while mom was pregnant with them, mom was food insecure, these things are still more likely to happen as the child grows. Okay, so a little bit more on child health. Um, children who are food insecure have problems you might expect. So more headaches, colds, ear infections. They tend to be deficient in some vitamins and minerals, which makes their immune system a little bit more weak. Um, children who are food insecure also develop things like asthma, anemia. We mentioned they're more likely to be overweight. So a little bit about the costs that all of us incur um, for this problem. This particular study looked at the costs to the total U.S. economy um, for illnesses linked to food insecurity. So this takes into account things like um, missed work days, compromised productivity, um, that sort of thing. And it estimates the cost at $130.5 billion per year um, lost in the U.S. economy due to food insecurity. Okay, we're going to take a moment and pause here to discuss some of what we have gone through in the previous slides. We know that you're in groups out there in your county, and we want you to have the opportunity to 
um, kind of visit about what you've heard and share some of your experiences. I'm going to start a five minute timer on your screen. If in your county you want to have more time than that, that's okay. You can go ahead and just hit pause on the presentation and take whatever time you need. If you want to add in a bathroom break or grab a drink, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll be back with you um, in a few minutes and ask that you take the time to really think about the questions that are on the screen. So have you observed the effects of food insecurity before um, in your community where you live now or maybe a place you lived prior? And what was the circumstance? What did it look like? Um, did you necessarily recognize it for what it was um, kind of at first blush? Um, so enjoy your conversation and we'll be back with you in a few minutes.
Okay, everybody, I hope you enjoyed your conversation and learned a little bit from each other about the food insecurity in your community and um, what you as a group may have um, observed. And our hope with all this is that it might be some inspiration for you in terms of identifying projects that you'd really like to get involved with in terms of working on alleviating food insecurity in your area. So the last little bit that I want to share with you about kind of SNAP and hunger and um, how these programs um, work together is to give you a little summary of the relief efforts that we have um, in place in Iowa and really around the country um, for this large problem of food insecurity. Um, so first is SNAP. This is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as Food Stamps, the largest safety net program in the United States. Um, the average benefit for SNAP is, is pretty small. Um, in Iowa, benefits range from about $84 to $117 a month, um, depending on where in the state that you live. The SNAP benefit is adjusted based on the cost um, of food in your area. So a SNAP recipient in New York City is going to have a much larger benefit than a SNAP recipient in um, you know, Waterloo, Iowa, for example. Um, the WIC program, you may have heard of this before. This is a food assistance program um, specifically for women, infants, and children. That's what WIC stands for, women, infants, and children. Um, families with children under the age of five can participate in WIC, um, as well as pregnant and um, breastfeeding or immediately postnatal women. And WIC provides a prescribed food package for the family um, of very specific foods um, that the family needs. And then also our food banking system. Um, we in Iowa are lucky to have a really um, progressive and um, exciting food banking system. We have eight food banks that serve the state. They um, do have an association um, that all of them belong to called the Iowa Food Bank Association. It's not really a governing body. It's more of just a network that um, brings them all together. So they can work collaboratively on projects. They can um, team up on proposals and um, funding requests and that sort of thing. Um, so as we've been doing some of the background work for this project, the Iowa Food Bank Association has been a great help. It's allowed us to um, bounce things like our planting decisions for our model donation gardens um, off of all eight food bank directors in the state um, by just communicating with one entity. So our food banks in Iowa do a lot of really neat things. Um, you're going to hear more about this um, on the next webcast from Sarah Boniface, who's the interim director of the Food Bank of Iowa. Um, but some of the things that our food banks do, um, they have pantries, both fixed brick and mortar pantries like that you might see in a church or um, just a standalone pantry. They also have mobile pantries, which are large trucks that go to areas um, that are particularly lacking in both food access and um, social service agencies that might operate a food pantry. Um, sometimes sending in a mobile food pantry is really the best way to go. Um, they have backpack programs that send backpacks full of food home with children at the end of the day on Friday um, in school districts where you have large numbers of children that don't have much to eat over the weekend who really depend on school food service for most of their weekly meals. Um, for those children, weekends are a real hardship. Um, so going home on Friday with a backpack full of food that gets delivered to the child's locker um, or to a, you know, a, a central location in the school where the child can pick it up um, is a great help. Um, farm to food donation. This is a tax credit um, that was passed by the Iowa legislature last year and it allows um, everyone from a backyard gardener or grower to a farmer to receive a tax credit for any food donated into a food pantry um, that issues receipts for the tax credit. Um, not all do. You'd want to check with your food pantries to make sure that they do. Um, but this is another way to just kind of encourage people to donate that fresh produce into the food pantry system. Um, cash donations 
really important for food banks and food pantries. Um, they rely a lot on purchasing select foods, especially some of those healthier foods like produce. Um, so whereas a lot of us think about donating canned goods from our cabinets and that sort of thing, that of course is important, but the cash donations can go a really long way. Uh, food banks have enormous purchasing power. They can get a great value for their dollar. Um, so if they have the dollar to purchase food with, they can get a lot more for it than we can get for our dollars. So they try to really encourage folks to consider cash donations to food banks as opposed to what we're used to, which is food donations. And then also charitable giving from grocery stores. A lot of grocery stores in Iowa have donation programs with their local food pantry or food bank um, and donate everything from canned goods to produce and um, we try to encourage that as much as we can. Um, some stores do much more of it than others but it definitely is a huge benefit to food banks um, when grocery stores are willing to uh, make that type of commitment. So a little bit about our role in terms of this food security question. We are creating a partnership through this project between SNAP Education, Human Sciences Extension and Outreach, and the Master Gardener Program to really look at this problem and look at how together we can address it. Um, our food banks are doing a great job. We're going to hear more about the work they do on our next webcast, but they really rely on creative partnerships to make these healthy foods more available. If you think about the context of the work that they do, in 2014, they moved 26 million pounds of food around the state to needy Iowans, those eight food banks in Iowa. Um, one part of that is the fresh produce that they try to distribute. And as you can imagine, fresh produce has complications that other foods don't. It's perishable, it's more delicate, so they really have to get creative about how they can make that work. Um, we're really hoping that Master Gardeners can be one of those creative partnerships and that really at the local level, Master Gardeners can be one of the kind of key pieces of getting these healthy foods into food pantries. Okay, so we've got a couple of you know, different options for how you can look at this. One is grow it. You can grow it. You all are you know, tremendous um, horticulturalists. You can grow these foods. You can also rescue them. You're well connected in terms of who is already growing foods and might be willing to uh, make donations. Another approach is to provide gardening education to families in poverty, the families who we want to support through this project ultimately, um, providing them with gardening education, um, tools, supplies, all of those could help make a difference as well. Um, we would encourage as you think about um, providing gardening education to families in poverty, one of the challenges is finding those families. So we would encourage you to, even if you choose this approach, to partner with your local food pantry. They will help you find those families. Okay, now Susan is going to join me and we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about these different strategies. Perfect, thanks Christine. So as Christine said, Master Gardeners are already doing this work. That's how this project came to be, is that we want to provide support to all of you that are already doing this work. And so what I wanted to do is just give a few examples that I know of. I'm sure there are hundreds out there, but just wanted to give a, a couple ideas. Uh, and in particular on the teach aspect of what Master Gardeners are doing in terms of this project. So I'm going to give a few examples of Master Gardener projects, and I also want to let you know about some resources that are available to you as Master Gardeners. So one project that I recently heard about is out of Dubuque County, and this is the Wading Pool Garden. So this project is focused on container gardens that are available to low to moderate income 
levels. And what the Master Gardener volunteers are doing is they're providing materials and plants and tools to people who are interested in starting a container garden. They might not have access to good soils or access to a lot of space, so what better way to use a wading pool than to start a garden? And I think another important part of this is that the Master Gardeners are also providing garden mentorship. So people aren't just getting the tools to get this, but they also have somebody to talk to about how their tomatoes are doing or how their herbs are doing. So this is just one project that you can think about in terms of this teach aspect. Another garden that I had the pleasure of visiting this fall when the garden was a little bit being put to bed but things were still growing is the is a cooperative garden in Polk County. So this is in the Kirkwood Glen neighborhood of Des Moines and it was founded by Master Gardener Ralph Chiodo. And this garden is in the middle of a, it's on the corner of a city block, so it's right in a neighborhood, and it provides space for neighbors to garden. And in terms of this teach aspect, it's also focused on providing an educational space for neighbors to come together and learn different skills. So cooking classes are provided both to teach culinary techniques and to also work with fresh foods that are coming out of the garden, and also sustainable uh, skill set classes are also taught so people can come and learn about bees, they can learn about growing a prairie and pollinators and chickens, um, also rain barrels. So these are, this is an educational space that is also a community garden that's providing food for the community. And then another garden is the Glenwood Giving Garden down in Mills County. And of course you know that they're growing thousands of pounds of food for their local food pantry and at the same time, they have this wonderful education uh, space so that they can provide both culinary education to adults and also teach kids different activities. So they teach people how to plant herb gardens, they've done seed tape activities, and they've also done demonstrations of cooking fresh foods out of the garden. So this is another example of how you as Master Gardeners can provide some educational opportunities to your neighbors. And one more thing I wanted to mention before I hand it back to Christine is that we've got, as many of you Master Gardeners know, we've got the Speakers Bureau where we've got a number of PowerPoint presentations and notes for those presentations that are focused on different topics that you as a Master Gardener could give in your community. Some of these topics are house plants, native perennials for sun and shade, deciduous shrubs, and to add to the program that we're doing this year, I also wanted to let you know that we've got two new Speakers Bureau presentations that are available. These are only about 20 slides, so they won't take very long, but one is focused on container and small space gardening with this idea that if you do uh, form a partnership to start to work with family, families experiencing low income that they might not have access to a big plot of wonderful soil to grow a garden, so maybe talking about some small space gardening, and also just a basic vegetable gardening presentation. So please uh, check out these new resources that are available to you as a master gardener that you could present on in your community. All right, I'm going to hand it back okay. to you. All right. Thank you, Susan. Um, so our next piece for today is we're going to look at some strategies that we use in SNAP education um, in our work that we do directly with families experiencing poverty. Um, this is referencing those um, classes I mentioned earlier in the webcast where we teach cooking and um, grocery budget management skills as well as basic nutrition education. Um, from that work we have you know devised some strategies that we feel are just kind of good go-to's when it comes to working with families experiencing poverty. As you can imagine the priorities of families in this situation can be a little bit different um, from families who have a lot of security in terms of 
of, you know, living in a home, having consistent work, um, not having to worry about some of those fundamental things like safety and food and that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of those strategies that are helpful um, when it comes to working with families in this particular situation. Now, of course, every family is different. So we wouldn't want you to assume that all of the things we talk about today apply to any family living in poverty. These are just some best practices that, that we've come up with. So first is understand their reality. Um, Susan mentioned they may not have access to outdoor space of any size. We may be talking about a fire escape, a small porch. Um, so container gardening that can be done in a relatively small space will be much more relatable for them and seem more possible. Um, also keep in mind they have competing priorities. Um, if, for example, a single mom is taking care of three kids, the idea of taking care of a plant might just be too much. So for a lot of um, folks who are um, in a really challenging place in their life, the idea of taking on gardening might not be so attractive. But we know that many families in Iowa, you know, have um, in their past a lot of positive experience with gardening, whether it was, you know, when they were children with their parents or their grandparents, or if it's something that culturally is very important to them. Um, a lot of um, larger immigrant populations in Iowa have a rich cultural history of growing food. Um, so even though for some families it could be really challenging, just don't even want to think about taking care of one more thing, we know that there's a lot of that kind of historical value of food gardening. Um, so we do think that there will be people out there who would find this kind of intriguing and possibly even kind of therapeutic. I know I find tending my, I, I don't have any land where I can plant food, but I do a container garden every year um, and I really enjoy it. So um, those are kind of the folks that we're looking for. Um, also keeping in mind that they might have limited cooking equipment, um, so, you know, not to um, propose that they plant or use things that are very complicated to prepare. Um, they may be less familiar with preparing and eating fresh fruits and vegetables. This depends on their life experience, you know, depending on if they grow up in a home where these things were available. Um, so just some things to keep in mind that we're going to have some varying level of experience um, with those foods. If you encounter someone who um, doesn't have a lot of cooking skills, is not accustomed to eating fresh fruits and vegetables, and really grew up in a household that also did not have access or eat fruits and vegetables, you're going to encounter some barriers there in terms of their confidence that they can prepare those fruits and vegetables. So that would be a good time to visit with your local nutrition and wellness specialist. They could help you with some recommendations to offer folks in that situation um, to help them feel more confident that they really can. Um, can use these foods in a pretty simple way. Uh, partner with agencies providing service to families with low income. Um, we have found in our programs when we recruit families into our direct education programs um, that just hanging up a sign that our excellent free program is available usually doesn't do the trick. Usually we have to develop a relationship with an agency in the community that's already serving those families and have them help us make that connection. So we've listed here on the slide some agencies that you might consider reaching out to. Um, your local WIC clinic, um, every community has one. Sometimes they're actually a brick and mortar office at a place like a public health department. And sometimes they're a traveling WIC clinic that comes to your area once a month or twice a month. Um, so visit with your local public health office if you wanna figure out what your local WIC clinic looks like. Um, obviously food pantries, they're gonna have great connections with this community. Um, schools with high rates of free and reduced price meals. Um, if you're curious about finding out which schools um, have those high rates, you can contact your local school district and they can share that information with you. Um, and then also local meal programs. If you have a, um, a church or an agency that offers a meal once a week, or some of them even offer a meal every day, um, that would be another agency that's going to be able to help you um, make connections with those families. Okay, um, thirdly, 
We find that many of the families that join us for our direct education programs um, really like to focus on the immediate. Um, so when we talk about something having health benefits in the long term, we tend to be less successful than if we talk about the immediate benefits of making a behavior or lifestyle change. Um, many of the families who we work with um, focus on the immediate because they haven't had the luxury of thinking about long into the future. Um, you know, they're thinking about, am I going to be able to make my rent this month? Am I going to be able to, you know, keep that job that I just started? Those types of things. Um, their lives tend to have a lot of, of kind of hectic aspects and chaos. Um, so if you suspect that the families that you're trying to recruit might be in that situation, it's helpful to think about immediacy and practicality, um, making sure that if you're giving um, recommendations or educational strategies, that you also provide them with tools and supplies to make it something they can start today. Um, and that's why we put these mini grants out as part of this project, is we want you to feel like you have the opportunity to apply some for some funds um, to really kind of wrap around your education and give um, also tools and supplies along with with that knowledge. Um, fourth, um, this one's pretty simple, avoid passing judgment. Um, many of the families who we work with in our direct education program have felt very much kind of under the eye um, of people looking to criticize them, whether that is, um, you know, the DHS, people um, looking at them in terms of parenting, in terms of their ability to provide for their children. Um, they often feel like social service agencies um, kind of judge their decisions. And regardless of, um, you know, kind of your own feelings about some of those um, issues, if you want to successfully work with these families, it's important to come from a place of hoping to understand their situation and work with them as opposed to passing judgment. Um, we find that the families in our direct education program are incredibly sensitive um, to any indication that we might be um, judging their decisions. Um, so we try to be very careful and very sensitive and come from that place of being the helpful, trusted friend as opposed to coming from a place of I'm the expert and you should listen to me. Um, that tends to not be very successful, but coming from the place of the helpful friend who knows a little something about gardening, that's much more likely to be successful. Okay, ensuring understanding. I'm sure this is something that you 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 know do with any of the folks that you're working with in your education programming. But keeping an eye on reading level, um, we tend to shoot for um, fifth grade or so reading level for materials. Um, I know the folks on campus are being sensitive to that as well. Um, but definitely contact us if you have questions about how to make something a little bit more. Um, easy to understand and get the reading level down if you feel like it might be kind of high. And then also translation when needed. You know, if you have a special population that you're trying to reach that's going to require translation, um, doing that whenever possible. And then our last one, number six, um, embracing the participants' experience. Um, we have found in our programs that teach um, cooking and nutrition and, and grocery budgeting um, that participants love to tell their stories and they love to bring their experience to the conversation. We use a dialogue-based approach to our teaching. Um, so a lot of conversation and the education kind of happens through that conversation. And when the participants have the opportunity to kind of tell their story, they're more likely to share with us what some of their challenges are, which allows us to identify how we can provide assistance. Um, whereas if we just ask them to tell us, they're far less likely to do so. Um, but if it's in the context of them kind of sharing their experience and sharing their story in that kind of friend to friend environment, um, we tend to have a lot richer conversations and the learning is much more authentic and rich. Um, so as I said before, when you can, avoiding too much of the 
um, teacher learner kind of dynamic and instead using a dialogue based approach where everybody's input is requested. Um, everyone in the room should be speaking um, during the education, not just the person who has the expertise, um, but really honoring and seeking that input from everyone, um, particularly with this audience. Um, they often feel like their input is not sought and that they are being told what to do. Um, so you doing that would really make you stand out as someone that they want to listen to and want to talk with. Um, so it should be helpful in your projects. Okay, so I am now going to turn it back to Susan um, to talk a little bit about some of the projects you do in Master Gardener um, that might benefit from some of these strategies. Perfect. Well, I've just made a very short, simple list here of some of the things that I understand Master Gardeners do. And what I wanted to do is tie some of these annual projects that you might be doing to some of the strategies that Christine was talking about. So just a few activities that I think you might already be doing. I know a lot of you do a spring plant sale where you're growing annuals and perennials and selling them to your community members. I know a lot of you put on workshops throughout the year. These can be educational activities, teaching people hands-on about pruning or about growing vegetables or about other topics that you find of interest. Also, I know a lot of you put on conferences, that there are spring conferences and fall conferences where you're bringing together lots of presenters to give presentations to maybe about 100 attendees or 200 attendees. I also know that a lot of you go to farmers markets and you have a booth at the farmers market where you're giving garden advice. And I also know that a lot of you are pulled into speaking to clubs, whether they want to hear about particular varieties that you would recommend that they plant in their garden or different ways of thinking about their garden. So these are just a couple master gardener projects that I thought tied in well to this teach activity. So now linking these to the strategies, we've got the six snap ed strategies here. Of course, we want to think about all of these, no matter what the project is. And I wanted to get into some specifics about what that would look like. So for example, if you, you typically do a workshop for your community, why not put on a workshop about container gardening? You could do these different aspects of uh, getting partners and you know thinking about immediacy in terms of providing materials to the people that participate and using this dialogue. There are a lot of these different pieces that you could pull into something that maybe you're already planning and maybe you think would be fun anyway and you could gain additional access and have a bigger impact in your community if you be more if you try to be more inclusive to another audience. Another activity is the plant sale. So I am under the impression that Polk County Master Gardeners have their plant sale, and then at the end of the sale, if they still have plants left over, they'll donate those to partner agencies. So maybe that's when a WIC clinic gets a bunch of tomato starts, or maybe that's when a donation garden gets a bunch of different plants. So this plant sale that you're already having, and you might already have leftover plants that you just don't know what to do with, Maybe that's when you pull in your partner agencies and ask them to start giving these out to the community or finding different gardens that would plant them. Another area is the farmer's market. So you're already sharing garden information with everybody and farmer's markets in Iowa are so nationally famous for what they do in terms of SNAP benefits. Um, many of the farmers have electronic benefit um, card machines so that they can accept food stamps right there at the market stand and there are um, women infants and children checks that are accepted at, at farmers markets so if you're already at the farmers market maybe what you could do is in addition to talking about gardening practices and answer, answering gardening questions you could share information about food access resources and maybe 
you want to let people know that there is a food bank or let people know that there is a free dinner at a nearby religious institution. So just um, you already have access to the public when you're there at the farmer's market. So maybe you want to think about providing some of these food access resources. Well, we're going to wrap up a little bit and toss some dialogue back to you all. Here's the contact information for both Christine and I, and also our email addresses are on the worksheet that you have for the webcast today. And next time that you see us, we're going to be talking about working with food banks. So Z Sarah Boniface is going to be here uh, on behalf of the food banks, and she's going to be talking about what are some of these pieces that you need to keep in mind when you're working with food banks and what do you need to know about food banks if you are growing and donating for them. And we're also going to get a little bit deeper into some um, Master Gardener examples of what's already happening around the state and also the, the ways that you could start to think about applying this information to a mini grant proposal because we want lots of mini grant applications. So based on the presentation and your small group discussions today, we want to have you end with one more small group uh, discussion, and this is the last slide, so you can um, stop the presentation after this, and you can take as much time as you need to to discuss this. My guess is that your wheels are turning and that you, you have some really great ideas about how to apply these six SNAP-Ed strategies to your existing Master Gardener projects. So if you could meet in a small group um, to talk about this first question of how you can apply those strategies. And then for the second question, if you're thinking about the teach aspect of this mini grant, what are some of the activities that your Master Gardener group could do to increase food security? And I'm hoping that by now you're interested in applying for a mini grant. So Discussing this second part is going to help you think about writing your proposal, which is a very simple proposal <laughs> and will be very easy for you to submit. So thank you again to Christine for presenting today, and we'll, uh, we'll start this timer for you all so that you can get your discussion going, and we'll hope that it continues and that you have fantastic ideas as to how to apply some of these principles to your projects. Thank you. Thank you.